You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. Scripture passage for today is from the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Set me as a seal over your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, passionate love unrelenting as the grave. Its darts are darts of fire, divine flame. Rushing waters can't quench love, rivers can't wash it away. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, good morning again, and those of you who are, again, who are online or here in person, welcome to worship here at the Peak Church. Today, we are going to do one of the most important things we do in the church. Today, we are going to uh, enact one of the most sacred sacraments that you'll ever find in the larger capital C church. And if you're new here to this church, new here to this community, or maybe this is the first time you've been in church for a really long while, if you're not, I'll explain. So what sacraments are, sacraments are just fancy language for what we might know as sacred actions, sacred actions. Sacraments are the things that we do in the life of the church to outwardly testify to something that is already inwardly true. Sacraments are where we give public demonstration to what is already privately real. Put very simply, sacraments are how we celebrate and sing out loud what we already know is true and evident in the quietness of our being. In many ways, what we're doing here today uh, in celebrating baptism is kind of like a wedding. It's kind of like a wedding. When you go to a wedding, uh, what happens there is you celebrate something that already is right? Something that's already started. When you go to a wedding, they are there to consecrate that these couples already fallen in love. They've already had conversations about life together. They have already had arguments about the proper way to fold towels. (laughs) Any of you rollers? You fold and then roll the towel? Some of you are like, yes, wrong, wrong, all of you, wrong, right? And so in a similar way, Baptism is like that. It is like it is you are using that moment to consecrate what already is. In a wedding, no one in their right mind would show up to the ceremony looking to start the relationship, right? That is unless uh, you go on this television show. Anybody ever watch this show, by the way? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? That's okay. Safe place. We can be nice and honest here, okay? My wife loves this show. I love making fun of this show. So what we do every night when she watches this show is she watches it and she's like, oh my gosh, like, do you think they're going to make it? This is so sweet and it's romantic. And I'm over there trying to like quietly dub over what they're really thinking when they see their partner for the very first time. And so we're going to do this together. Okay, we're going to do this together. You can do it with me, right? So this is the f- one couple uh, when they first met. What do you think he's thinking? When I saw this episode, uh, my thought was, sweet Lord, what the heck is on your head? Uh, That's what was running through his head. Uh, That's what was running through his mind. I married the owl lady. That's that's what I did. Okay. Next one. Next one. Okay. He looks like he has to tinkle. (laughs) And she's sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to have to reach the cereal for him for the rest of our lives. That's, um, that's what I'm in for now. This is great. This is great. Number three, third couple. So this one 
I immediately was like, he's been telling jokes that are not funny for so long. Now her face is stuck in the fake laughter mode, right? So she's like, oh, oh my God, it's so funny. Please stop. And the last one is this one. This one's one of my personal favorites, okay? <laughs> he is super bummed because right before they got married, she said he's not allowed to jump on the bed anymore. And so he's really bummed about what uh, his life is going to look like on the other side of this. Right? Nobody. Nobody in their right mind does weddings like this. And so like a normal wedding, like a normal ceremony, baptism is a place it's, a, it's an action. It is a discipline, an exercise that we enact here in the church to give testimony, to give voice to something that's already begun, that's already started, whether we're aware of it or not. Baptism is what we do here in the life of the church to sort of give voice to, to give demonstration to. There's this force at work in the world that's been working on us. It's been moving in our lives. It's been grabbing hold of our attention. Baptism is where we give testimony to the fact that there's this force that's been chasing after me, pursuing after me before I ever chose to chase after it. Baptism is the moment where we celebrate that uh, this force that's at work in our lives, it's changing how we think, it's changing how we feel, it's changing what I want most out of life. Baptism is where we give voice, we give demonstration, we give testimony to the fact that this force simply will not relent until it has won us over completely. As you might have guessed, after hearing our scripture passage for today, that force is none other than love. We're not talking about just any type of love here today. We're talking about that capital L love, the one who is love embodied, love incarnate. When you go back to our passage for today in Song of Solomon, you see that we've got these authors, we've got these people who have had this encounter with love. They've had this encounter uh, with love that's changing everything about their being, and so they're writing about it. They're writing as much things as they can about it. And one of the things about uh, Song of Solomon, our scripture for today, that I want to give you a little bit of context on, is uh, Song of Solomon is what uh, scholars might call one of the tweener books of the Bible, one of the tweener books of the Bible. So what that means is everything you read in this book, uh, it's, it's like right in the middle. Like some of it could apply to our earthly love, romantic love, love with another person, but also a lot of what you find in Song of Solomon is applicable to divine love, the love we've come to encounter in God. And so it's really fascinating because if you can think of it this way, that also uh, it's not too dissimilar than a lot of the worship songs we sing in places like this, in churches like this, right? A lot of them are really sappy and gooey in their relationship with God. And so I'll prove it to you. We're going to play a little game here this morning as we get going. Uh, One of my favorite games uh, I like to call Bay or Yahweh, okay? (laughs) Bay or Yahweh. If you don't know what Bay is, Lean over to a Gen Z person in this church and ask them. Uh, Yahweh is the Old Testament name given to God. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to put a lyric on the screen. And you have to tell me, were they singing about their baby or their Yahweh? Ready? Here we go. First up. Your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place. Your love is extravagant. I don't know if you need to like read it that way, but I'm going to read it with a little bit of a voice. Here we go. Ready? Bay. Yahweh. Well done. Here we go. Bethel worship. Here we go. Your love is extravagant. Give yourself a round of applause. Good job. Good job. Your phrase is extravagant. Here we go. Moving on. Second one. I hear a lot about sinners. Don't think I'll be a saint, but I might go down to the river. Bay or Yahweh? Raise your hand for Bay. Raise your hand for Yahweh. Justin Bieber fans in the house. Well done. Here we go. Holy by Justin Bieber. And the final one. This one's a little weird. Here we go. Lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heartbeat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. Some of you are like, this is getting a little weird uh, in church this morning. I don't know. I thought we were just showing up for like a baptism. This is kind of of weird. Ready? Bay. All right, Yahweh. Yahweh! Let's go! The more I seek you by Bethel Worship. You can worship with that song and feel a little bit uncomfortable about your relationship with God if you're interested uh, later today. 
And so as a pastor, as a pastor, I got to thinking about this. I got to thinking about this. Like, why, why is that the case? Is that on accident that both in Song of Solomon and in a lot of our worship songs, they're kind of like in this, they're like tweeners. Like you could, they could, they're in between lyrics. Like you could write them to talk about your love on earth, or you could write them to discuss and elaborate about the love you experienced in heaven. And I think the reason for which actually comes in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 reads, Dear friends, let's love each other. Because love is from God and everyone who loves is born from God. Now, I want you to pay attention if you missed that. Everyone who believes all the right stuff, everyone who judges other people for what they think about the world, no, 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 no having other theology figured out, other questions answered. Everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. Conversely, the person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. One of the things I love about this passage is that what it does is it illumines for us that we have a God in Jesus who don't play by your rules This God will not be restrained to only express God's love through spiritual or religious means only. No, the God that we have in Jesus is one who is finding any and every means necessary, any and every expression of true love necessary to get a hold of our attention, to captivate our hearts, and to change us forever. And so sometimes you're going to find that love here, and many other times you're going to find it out there in the wild. And so here in Song of Solomon, what the authors are doing is they're talking about this. They're giving testimony that this love, this capital L love, is changing them. It's, it's altering their perspective. It's altering their entire life. And so they're writing to give testimony to this. And so, friends, what we're here to do today is the same thing. Because you see what baptism is. This is an opportunity for us to testify to both ourselves and to the world what we have learned about this love. The first of which is this. The first thing that baptism is today, the first thing that baptism celebrates, that it testifies to, that it demonstrates, is that one of the things that we as followers of Jesus have learned to be true of love is this, that death always loses to love. Come on, I'm speaking to a room full of Christians right now. Amen? Amen. Death always loses to love. And you see this in Song of Solomon, right? He says this. He says, for love is as strong as death, passionate love, unrelenting as the grave. And I think it's really important that this morning we draw attention to the fact that this is applicable not only to death, but all of death's little friends. You see, some of you are here today, and for you, this, you need this reminder that love is stronger than death. You need that because if you've had encounters with death. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's someone you love. Some, maybe it's you. Or maybe for you, you're coming in today, and it's not death you've been. It's that death has not been your constant companion, but it's been death's friends. It's all death's little buddies which look like this, can look like any one of this. It can look like disease. It can look like depression. It can look like addiction, hatred, violence, despair. It can look like crippling anxiety, pride, unfaithfulness, dishonesty, greed, isolation. These are just the ones I can fit on a screen. And everybody in this room knows that those things can destroy a life. It's what we're here to testify to today is that love is stronger than every single one of these. And maybe you're here today, and listen, I get it. Maybe for you, when you look at the news, and you look at your news feed, and when you leave here, it's really tempting to believe that death actually is stronger, right? Especially when you look at the news or look at anything going on in our world, it actually can be tempting to believe, no, death is winning. Darkness is winning. I've got so much evidence of this. And I hear that. I can sympathize with that. But friends, what I'm also here to say to you, I think part of my job as a preacher is to remind you that the examples of this might not be as loud. They may not be as public. They might not be as obvious. 
But love is taking ground back. In the last three weeks alone, I have had three, count them three, uh, I like to say uh, appointments that God put on my calendar. So I didn't put them on my calendar. I was going about my merry business, and then these people just showed up, and we had conversation, one of which happened on the golf course. Now, those of you who know me know that's actually funny because I'm actually the least Christian uh, on the golf course. I have to, at the end, have a priest come, and we sort of rededicate my life to Jesus because of all of the words that I have said and uh, things that I've been tempted to break. Anyway, I'm out there on a golf course, and I'm, uh, I get partnered up with somebody who's in active recovery. So they suffer from substance abuse for a long portion of their life. And they just start sharing with me that they're like, I, this is my story, this is where I come from, but it! like, I don't want this to be the thing that defines my life. Like, I don't want that to be the final word said about me. I refuse there's just something at work in me. I don't know, but there's something in my heart, something in my mind that says there's more, and I want it to be about more. I want my life to be about more than that. Then, two weeks later, I'm sitting in my office, I get a phone call from someone who is connected to this church who is suffering some incredible anxiety. And so they show up. They need someone to pray with. And so we sit right here in these chairs. Steph, she was sitting right there in that chair you're sitting in. And she shares about her divorce and all of the uh, struggles she's had earlier in life, and she's watching this anxiety sort of paralyze her life, and she's like, but I don't, there's something, well, like, all those, are, that's happening to me, but there's this other force sort of, like, emerging inside of me saying that there's hope and that I, I can have a better life and I can have a better future, and I don't want that to be the only thing told about my story. And then the last one happened yesterday at Mattress Factory. I need a new bed. I walk in there for a new mattress. And the Lord says, you can walk out of here with one of those, but I also need you to do a little bit of work for me. Here we go. And so I meet this guy, and he starts sharing that up until this point, his life has been riddled with trauma, riddled with trauma. And he said, at several points, I've been tempted to quit, but there's this little voice that keeps nagging at me saying that I can do more. My life can be about more. And immediately when I got home, and I'm not joking, immediately when I got home yesterday, I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw this quote. And it is easily now one of my favorite quotes in the entire world. It captives, it captivates everything that I heard in these three stories. And it reads like this. It says, it ran in my family till it ran into me. Ran in my family. I don't know what the it is for you. He ran in my family until that thing ran into me. And friends, I'm here to tell you, I'm here to remind you that the story that Jesus will tell, when we pass from this life to the next, when we pass from this world to the next, the story that Jesus will tell over all of creation is that it, sin, selfishness, death, destruction, ran in my humanity until it ran into me. Until it ran into love. The one who is love. And so today we're here to give testimony to that. We're here to give testimony for those of us who have forgotten that death always loses to love, if not in this life and the one to come. And the second thing we're going to do in just a moment is we're going to give testimony to the other thing that we as Christians know to be true of love. And it's this. That love cannot run out. That if we're talking about real capital L love, not talking about my love, not talking about your love, that our love can be a little bit fickle. But if we're talking about the true capital L love, the God who is love, that love cannot, it is unable, it is impossible for that love to run out. And again, you see this in Song of Solomon. What does he say in verse 7? Rushing waters can't quench this thing. Rivers can't wash it away. Now, here's the issue we have. Okay? Here's the issue we have. A hundred percent of Christians believe what I just said. Believe that to be true in theory. The issue we have is there's a much smaller percentage of Christians who believe it in practice. Why? Why? Well, it's because 
one of my jobs as a pastor is also to be a historian of the history of the church and this movement that Christ has called us into. And one of the things that I've picked up on is that somewhere, some way, at some point, Christians started taking more pleasure in scaring people with hell than captivating people with heaven. I'm going to say that again real quick for the people in the back. At some point in the history of this thing, people like me in places like this, we started taking more pleasure in scaring people with hell than captivating them with heaven. It's because, it, I mean, I don't know. Everyone's probably got different reasons for this, but for some, I think it's because it feels good. It feels good for love, for God's love to be only uh, available for people like me, for people who believed of all the right things, have done all the right things, who are in my sort of tribe or in my sort of grouping. But I'll tell you something. Those are actually the Christians that I worry the most about in this life. I actually don't worry uh, too much about the Christians who, uh, who struggle with their relationship with church or maybe they've got a lot of questions. You heard Bob so beautifully and honestly share about his story. I don't worry so much about the Christians who have questions or who have doubts or who have regrets or who struggle to believe. It's the Christians who are trying to control God's love that I worry the most about. It's the ones who think it's their job to predetermine, well, let's see who qualifies, who's, who's, uh, who's achieved their ability to be here. Those are the ones I worry about. And the reason for which is we're going to celebrate in just a couple weeks. Friends, you heard Amanda mention this. In a couple weeks, we're going to celebrate Good Friday. Some of you won't be here. You'll be celebrating at your churches back home and whatnot. But the Church Universal is going to gather together on Friday, April 7th, and we're going to celebrate Good Friday. And Good Friday is so many things. It's such a significant day as we really sit with the implications of the cross and Christ's sacrifice for us. But friends, at the core, at the core, you want to know what Good Friday is? It's a testimony. It was a universal act. It was a universal message from God that God, if he had to choose, this God would rather go to hell than send you there. That this God is way more focused on rescuing people from hell than locking them there away forever. And the reason why I know that's true is because of my own story. It's because of where I come from myself. And don't take just my word for it. Good Lord. This is all over Scripture. One of my favorite passages of Scripture comes from Psalm 139. And in Psalm 139, what we find is someone talking about this very thing. Someone writing down in a little journal entry how they've tried, they've actually physically tried, to escape God's love. To say, let's just really test and see if like, this love actually is as unconditional and as unlimited as everyone says it is. We're going to see, right? We're going to see. And so what I did was, as I took Psalm 139, and I actually would encourage you to do this as a practice. This can actually make the Bible come alive to you. Take a passage of scripture that you really resonate with and rewrite the content of it, the themes of it, in your own words, using your own experiences, using things you've actually been through. I'm going to share with you mine, okay? This is me rewriting Psalm 139 with things I've actually thought and things I've actually done. Psalm 139, the original reads, where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? My translation, is there anything I can do to make you fall out of love with me? Is there ever a moment when you stop running after me? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. My translation, if I act like a good Christian, I know you'll be around. But even when I drank myself numb, let my anger take control of me, and I settled for fake intimacy, even then, even then, you never left. You never left. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would guide me, even there your strong hand would, ride up, would uphold me. 
I even tried to succeed and achieve my way out of this. I thought ambition could numb my pain, silence my anger, or erase the emptiness. But even there, you invited me to find rest. Even there, your arms embraced me. You guided me back home. Last one. The author wrote, if I said, darkness, the darkness will definitely hide me. The light will become night around me. Even then, the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine bright as day because darkness is the same as light to you. There was even a time when I said, I don't believe in you anymore. And I don't want you or this thing anymore. And even then, even then you weren't offended. Even then you would not be turned away. Nothing changed in terms of your love for me. The only thing that's beginning to change is my ability to resist you, to resist it any longer. Amen. Going back to the quote you heard a moment ago in our baptism video, friends, I believe Rachel Held Evans is right. I believe that it's time for the church, for Christians, to regain some of our weirdness. And I'll tell you, one of the weirdest things about God is that every time I bailed, every time I forsook, every time I quit, this God Never quit on me, but came running after me. And up until this point, I've just never met anyone quite like that. Maybe you have. I'll wait. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.com dot org.